Good morning. Sunday the 29th of March. It's day three of our 21 day journey through the New Testament during the Corona lockdown. And today we are reading Matthew chapter 25 to 28 and then the first eight chapters of Mark. And while there are many observations that I could share with you from the reading today, it was one overwhelming thing that struck me as I read through those final chapters of Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapters 26 and 27 in particular. And that is how Matthew displays in his gospel the complete and ubiquitous, that means all covering, complete and total, it, it, it concerns all people, the ubiquitous sinfulness of the human race. In contrast to the innocence and purity of Jesus Christ. Um, so in Matthew 26, Jesus is now um, heading towards his death and the wickedness of man is, is displayed. Uh, we see Judas uh, betrays Jesus knowing that he was innocent. He betrays him for 30 pieces of silver. Um, the mob then comes with Judas to the Garden of Gethsemane and this mob then arrests Jesus knowing that he was innocent. Uh, the disciples, his best friends, then all forsake him and they run away, knowing that he was innocent. The Jewish leaders, so that's Caiaphas, the elders, the chief priests the, um, and, and the scribes, they set up a mock court and they've got false witnesses there that they've installed in this court proceeding. And having placed their false witnesses there, surprise, surprise, they find Jesus guilty of blasphemy and they condemn him to death, though they knew he was innocent. Uh, the same dignified leaders of Israel, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, so dignified, they are then seen spitting in Jesus' face, um, knowing him to be innocent. And they beat him and then those around them in the courtroom begin climbing in and they slapping him in the face, mocking him and saying, come on, prophesy, who is it that's, that hit you that, this time? Um, and all of this is happening while they all know that he's innocent. Uh, Peter, uh, Jesus' best friend, is, uh, is then seen denying Jesus three times. Uh, he denies that he even knows Jesus even though he knows what Jesus is busy going through is unjust because he knows Jesus is innocent. Uh, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, so this is now the head of the sort of legal system, the, law, the one who should bring law and order to all of this. Um, he refuses to defend Jesus from the Jews, though he knew Jesus was innocent. Even uh, Pilate's wife had had a dream and she sent message, uh, a message to him in the court saying, have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things in a dream tonight because of him. And even though he knew that Jesus was just, he refuses to defend him. And he basically, he washes his hands of the situation. He says to the Jews, you can, you can basically do whatever you want with him. He was a coward. Um, then we see the crowd. This is now, let's see if the common people do any better than the rest of mankind. No, uh, the common people ask for Barabbas uh, to be released instead of Jesus. And they knew that Barabbas was, in Matthew's words, a notorious prisoner uh, whom they all knew was a murderer. And they, they ask for him to be released. And concerning Jesus, who they knew to be innocent... They cry out, let him be crucified and let his blood be on us and our children. They just were baying for blood. Uh, the Roman soldiers. So again, this is now the police of the day should have been protecting what was right and just. Uh, how do the Roman soldiers uh, survive the story? Well, they dress up Jesus like a king. They shove a crown of th thorns into his forehead and they then beat him while they are mocking him. And then they take him to the hill of the skull, Golgotha, and they crucify him. And while he's hanging there, this innocent man, Matthew tells us that not only were the Jewish leaders, the chief priests and the elder scribes, standing there while he was hanging there on the cross suffering, mocking him. But Matthew tells us that those who passed by, these just random people walking past, 
They blasphemed him, shaking their heads, saying to me, come on, you said you'd uh, build the temple, pull it down, instead, pull it down and build it up in three days. If you're the son of God, come on, man. Bring yourself up off the cross, shaking their heads at him, mocking at him while he suffered there. Um, if all of that doesn't cover every one of the human race um, with the same blanket of shame and darkness and sinfulness, Matthew then says that even the robbers who were on either side of him, suffering and dying with him, even they reviled him with these same things. Both robbers. Now we know that in the grace of God from one of the other Gospels tells us that one of those robbers got saved. One of those robbers, just before he died, he gets born again. His eyes are opened to who Jesus truly is and he asks Jesus to forgive him. And Jesus graciously, in the face of all this, says, yes, today you'll be with me in paradise. But Matthew doesn't tell us this. Matthew paints this completely ubiquitous, dark picture of the human race by contrast to the bright, innocent meekness of Jesus. And as he finishes with those last two robbers, then, then Matthew tells us that darkness covered the earth for three hours. What a picture of the ubiquity of sinfulness of man. The only person in this whole terrible story who comes out pure and admirable and with any dignity is Jesus himself. He endured all this wickedness, even though he said he could have called 12 legions of angels down to, to carry him off the cross and to save him. He, he, Matthew says he said that to his disciples, and yet he didn't. He willingly took all of the sin and darkness of the whole human race turning their back on him. Why? Because he was suffering for our sins. He was taking the punishment for our guilt upon himself so that we could be forgiven all this darkness and sin. And so blessed be his name. Thank you, Jesus.